family and on my own behalf, a very warm welcome to our Club Methodist Church. And I would like to especially extend a very warm welcome to my Archeo clergy colleagues and friends. Father Corrie McCoughlin from St. Mary and St. Peter's in the centre of the town, and also to Canon Arthur Barrett from the Church of Ireland, and Reverend Michael Anderson from the Presbyterian Church, and Pastor Solomon from the Arclo Community Church. And the, uh, Patricia from the Loaves and Fishes Church extends her apology, she cannot attend, and Reverend Arthur, or Reverend Doherty, Andrew Doherty, our, our Southern District Superintendent, cannot attend this evening. He has to officiate at a funeral. And also, we're joined by the President of the Methodist Church in Ireland, the Reverend Dr. Saria Basu. You're welcome, sir. And the Southern District lay leader, Mrs. Jilly Hines, and her husband, Ross. And also by the Reverend David Nixon. He, David is president designate of the Methodist Church and he's also superintendent of the South East Leinster Circuit, comprising of Arklow, Gorey, Bray, Wicklow, and Dunleary Methodist Churches. And also a very welcome to past Arklow ministers present the Reverend Donald Rogers and the Reverend Rosemary Lindsay, and also to any county councillors present. And Reverend Iberone sends his apologies also. He's unable to be with us. And I've just had a thought. Zar, when I was candidating for ministry, Zar was my worship tutor. <laughs> and when I was candidating for ministry, Reverend Rosemary was my, I was on placement with her and for her, so I really better up my game. <laughs> <laughs> so this afternoon, we need to celebrate the, when the first Methodist society met in Abbey Lane in our club 200 years ago. This beginning has shaped who we are at our club Methodist Church, and I'm very glad to say that our story is still unfolding today. So this service is a time for thanking God for the past and looking to the future. This service is a time for celebrating the life and witness of all who have gone before us, and also those who serve today. And Tuesday is Alders Gate Day, also a very important day in the Methodist Church, because on the 24th of May, 1834, a very, the, the Reverend John Wesley celebrated a very special spiritual encounter with God. It was a life-changing event in his Christian journey. He unwittingly attended worship at a Moravian religious society meeting at Aldersgate Street in London. And it was during this service that he felt his heart strangely warmed and experienced God's love in a unique and personal way. Until then, he had known God in his head, not in his heart. So I pray that our time together that we, each of us here, will experience an encounter with the living God. And also, in the words of John Wesley on his deathbed, the best of all is God is with us. And now we, I was going to say we sad to sing, but now we sing our opening hymn written by Charles Wesley, Love Divine, our love is and I hope that you all have a little hymn book to see you.
and prayers. We continue as we pray to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. With gratitude to those who have gone before, we gather celebrating our life and our worship together. With anticipation as we step into the future, we gather looking ahead to our life together. We gather to worship and serve the living God, the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Looking forward to see our path ahead, we gather, looking back, to see the paths taken. We honour those who have gone before us, learning from their success and their failures. Today, we celebrate who we are and welcome the possibilities and opportunities before us. But above all, we gather to worship and give thanks to the God of yesterday, the God of today, and the God of tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your Son Jesus Christ. Through his coming, you have blessed us with the light of love. You have filled our world with darkness, with your light, and you have illuminated our hearts with good news and made your glory shine upon us so that nothing shall ever overcome it. Glorious Father, and we give you thanks for the Methodist witness in our club for the past 200 years. Strengthen us, we continue to ask, and we pray for the action to strengthen us along the journey of life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Almighty God, you raised your servants John and Charles Wesley to proclaim anew the gift of redemption and the light of holiness. Pour out your spirit and revive your works in us, and inspired by the same faith and upheld by the same grace in word and sacrament, we and all your children have been made one in the unity of your church on earth. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Jesus loved to share and pray with his disciples. And now, using the words that Jesus gave us, gave to us as God's children on earth, together we pray the family prayer of the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Michael, who will read for us from Genesis chapter 1, followed by a reading from Acts chapter 2. Reading from, from, from Genesis chapter 1, and beginning with verse 26. <coughs> God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Oh, and that reading 
from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mike. I had to keep the buttons toes. <laughs> so from the readings, we, we, we see that God's Spirit was active at creation. God's Spirit was active on Pentecost at the birth of the church. And the best, God's Spirit is still active. And I now invite Reverend David Nixon to read from John chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace. And truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Dave. We now stand to sing the Spirit of God and seen as the wind. <laughs>
Samson and everybody. If you are like me, this is normally when I have the time, the time of the day when I have my afternoon siesta. <laughs> I say that because I am going to need a lot of your prayers to keep me awake as I speak. <laughs> it's good to be back here. My wife and I and the kids serve on this circuit and in this church from 1996 to 2000. It was actually our first appointment when we returned to Ireland from Sierra Leone, so it's good to be back, and especially to be back on this very important day of the life of God's people here. <coughs> As I was climbing that little step there, I realized how much I have aged since. <laughs> because my knees, you are telling me. Now, I don't know how many of you will appreciate this, but it is, this afternoon is particularly difficult for me because there are so many ministers here. And it is not easy to preach to your colleagues. <laughs> I'm sure. So again, I'm going to need your prayers. And for those of you who are my colleagues, when you hear what I'm saying and you're looking at me, just smile a little bit. That's a little bit of encouragement. <laughs> yeah? Even if you didn't like what I was saying, just smile. <laughs> that will do me fine. So it's good to be here and to be able to share in this service many times, especially for the invitation and for the warm welcome today. Catherine has already told you that we are not actually celebrating 200 years from this building in which we meet and worship and celebrate. We are celebrating 1822, the chapel which is no longer up in Abbey Lane 200 years ago. Again, to just remind you, that was not the time when Methodism's present, presence was in Arkle. It's long before 1826. In fact, I think it was in 1798. So that's what we are celebrating today. That first gathering of Methodists in their own building in Adelaide, here in Adelaide. So before I go on to speak to you, I would invite you that we pray. Let's pray. God, you have never been silent. And when you have spoken, your words never return to you empty. And when you speak, you bring life in the places of death. You bring light into the places of darkness. You bring the vibrance of your Holy Spirit and the deadness and challenges of life. And if we could pray for anything this afternoon, that is what we pray for. That as we listen to your word, as we reflect upon your word, as we speak your word, you will speak. You will help us to hear, especially in those places of our lives where we need you most. So here we are, Lord, surrender to you and to you alone. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. This is an anniversary that we are celebrating. 200 years. And I know that anniversaries are as much about the future 
as they are about the past and the present. About where we are going as they are about where we have come from and where we are at now. Now, reading the history of the Methodist Christian presence in Bible, I was very keenly made aware of the fact that we stand or we sit on the shoulders of giant saints. When I talk about saints, I'm not talking about necessarily just canonized people, but I'm talking about saints in terms of Christians in general. You know, you cannot read the history of any church and not be so keenly aware of the connectedness, of the diversity and variety of people whom God uses to build his church. And sometimes they may not even be people of the church as well. And that, for me, gives me encouragement because it says to me that truly, in the beginning, God created human beings in his image and likeness. And so every human being, whether they are in church or not, are valuable to God. They matter to God. So, we are here today, sitting and standing on the shoulders of child. And that fact extends beyond the history of the Methodist Christian presence in Arthur. It is also true of the history of the faith that we profess as Christians. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews puts it another way. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Hebrews 12. 1. So, given that reality, a church anniversary is about celebrating. Celebrating connections. Celebrating relationships. Celebrating people. And such celebrating of necessity involves storytelling. So, that is what I want to do this afternoon. I want to tell stories stories of where we come from as a church, our beginning. And by we, I don't specifically mean our methods community. Instead, I mean the church of Christ in every age and place and time. So I hope, I hope that the stories I tell would help us assess where we, in Afro Methodist Church, come from, where we are, and where we are going. My people, and when I talk about my people now, I'm not just talking, I'm not talking about my people in Ireland, I'm talking about my people in Sierra Leone. And my people say that if you don't know where you're going, know where you come from. And that's a good reason for that. Because, you see, in life, sometimes you do get lost, don't we? But when we are traveling, wherever that journey is taking us, and we realize we are lost, if we know where we have come from, we can always go back and retrace our steps and keep going. But if you don't know where you come from and you get lost, you're really lost. So, where do we come from? By we, I mean the Church of Christ. To answer that question, I want to briefly tell three stories of our beginning. I will hopefully, if there is time, finish with a fourth story which will be about our destination. By that, I mean the story which indicates where we are going. So the first story. The first story comes <coughs> right at the beginning of the Christian 
under the Jewish scriptures. In the beginning, God created, we read in Genesis 1. Now, when you read that, just that one sentence, you don't have to know the rest of the story to know that the heavens, the earth, and every created thing comes from God. And it's sustained by God. And it's accountable to God. And that includes you and I. That story of our beginning has important indications of the nature and the character of the God you and I worship here today and have always been worshiping. It has been suggested that if you want to know more about the Creator, look at the creation. And the careful observation of creation will soon reveal to the observer that nothing in it exists in isolation from the other things, independent of others. Animals and plants, earth and sky, water and light, people and the environment, the material and the spiritual. The writer of Genesis does not want us to lose sight of that very important fact, the connectedness of creation. All right. Ours relationship is at the heart of creation, folks. And the language, the language used in the creation of human beings suggests the creator desires relationship. Do you like me to remind you of that language? It starts with let us. Let us create, God says. And when I read that, it causes me to ask, does the creator God exist in community? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perhaps a hint right at the beginning of the scriptures? Is there a hint here that the God of creation exists in relationship? I wonder. Let us create human beings in Listen to this other word, our image. Is there a hint here that the God of creation, who already exists in community, desires to expand that community, to extend his circle of relationships? In other words, human beings as God's image bearers, family with God, in other words, relationship again. Now, why we ponder those questions about relationship and community in the first story of our beginning, let me quickly move on to the second story I want to briefly highlight. The second story of our beginning we read and had from and David. In the beginning was the world. The world was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. So I ask you to fast forward to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Did you hear that? Made His dwelling among us, not away from us, not somewhere else of his own, but among us. And we know that by this time in our story, something has gone terribly wrong with God's project relationship that we read about in the first story. Project Eden, if your life, has gone pear shaped as Adam and Eve have decided to do their own thing apart from and independent of God. Cain has killed his brother Abel and denied he is his brother's keeper. Human beings have chosen each to make a name for themselves, independent of God 
against relationship and community. But, and this has an important point, instead of abandoning us to ourselves, to our fate, God decides instead to move in with us. Relationship. That is simply what I understand John 1 to be about. God chooses to move in with us in the person of Jesus Christ. A concrete demonstration of God's desire to be a life enhancing, to be in life enhancing relationship with us. Now, do I need to tell you? To tell you what we got up to in response to God's desire to be with us? The answer is crucifixion, folks. That's how we responded to the word of God. The answer is awful Friday. The Friday of death. The death of God's plan to salvage his plan of relationship with us. But on Easter Sunday, the God of relationship chose to turn horrible Friday into what we so easily call our good Friday rather than thinking of it. On that day, Easter Sunday, love overcame hate. Death was replaced with life. Hope took the place of cynicism, all because of the God of relationship. And by the end of the day, God raised Jesus, the third story of our beginning started. We read about it in John 20, 22. The raising Christ gives the apostles three gifts in that text. First gift, peace be with you. When do we ever talk about peace? It is only in relationships where there is no peace, and there is no peace because there is no relationship, or there may be relationships that enhance death rather than relationships that enhance life. So the first gift to the disciples, peace. Then Jesus goes on to say to them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I say, when they read that, sending them as what? And there's a clue in the first words that Jesus says to them, peace. To be peace us in the world. And when we become peace bearers in the world, we are then ourselves firmly in the business of relationship building to enhance life, all of our lives together. So that is the first gift, peace to the church. And then after that, he gives them gift number two. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. When I did that, I said to myself, I think God knows what he's told me. Because building peace is not easy, is it? It's very complicated. Christians are going to need the Holy Spirit, the help of God, to do that. That's the second gift. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now this is John's Pentecost. Luke takes place, Luke's Pentecost takes place many weeks later in the Acts of the Apostles. So let me summarize so far. If I see you sleeping, I will call your name. Okay? God makes us in his image. God comes in Christ to dwell among us with us after we have chosen to go our way. And now God comes to live in us. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And here comes the third gift. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The power to forgive is the third gift. Jesus gives his church. So we know that is.
is the beginning of our third uh, story. We know the gift of the Holy Spirit spells the birthday of the church of Christ. Pentecost is what we call it today. I would argue that Pentecost is not our first birthday. It is our second birthday. The first birthday was our creation and that first story that we had earlier on. And now Pentecost comes, the new birth. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must experience that birth. You must be born again, he said to Nicodemus. The new creation within you must be experienced in order to bless you. And that creation is not something that you struggle for yourself, but I am the one who is going to do it through you. You must be born again. The recreation of lives bent on destructive relationships with each other, with creation and so with their creator. Folks, all three of the post-resurrection gifts of Jesus to the church, they all point to one thing, relationship. If you forget anything today after this service, don't forget life-enhancing relationships. That's why God placed us on this earth, because God was also truly aware that relationships can be life So peace, relationship. The Holy Spirit, relationship. The power to forgive, relationship. Equipped with those gifts, Jesus sends the disciples, his apostles, into the world to reveal the God of relationships. As I was saying to people in glory today, we all so easily just flows from our lips. Jesus Christ is raising, he is raising indeed. Hallelujah. And I was asking them, but well, how do you notice? How do other people notice that Jesus Christ is living in you and is alive? That's a real question for us Christians. Folks. So Jesus blesses them with those gifts. And he sends them into the world to reveal the God of relationship through acts of justice and peace and fulfilling the commission to be the arbiters of forgiveness. Jesus gives his disciples the Holy Spirit to help them in that very daunting task. So relationship, relationship is at the core of the three stories of our beginning that I have noted here today. In the first story, God lays down the foundation and the structures of life lived in life-enhancing relationships. God gives human beings the task of unleashing this potential of life in creation, thereby enhancing life. And then in the second story, God shows through the life of Jesus that sacrifices need to be made for life-giving and life-enhancing relationships to be possible. I don't need to give you examples for that. Let me just quote the words of John Wesley, telling us that for God to achieve what God set out to do, that is life enhancing relationships, God had to make a sacrifice. Here is how Charles Wesley understands that sacrifice. He left his father's throne at all so free. So in fact, his grace, listen to this, empty himself for God. Oh, the problem of the church today, the problem of Christians today is that we are too full. And often too full of our traditions, too full of our power, too full of our resources, too full of our knowledge, too full of our understanding. And there is no place for God to operate in and through us. He emptied himself of all of love. Therefore, Adam has kept this place. His mercy all immense and free for all oh my God. 
Then in the third story, God in Christ enables us by His Holy Spirit to empower us of His image. His makers and share us of the goodness of the goodness. To all peoples, of all nationalities and ethnicities, of all backgrounds, of all ages, of all views, Oh, I wonder when the church is going to realize that from God's perspective, there are no divisions in this world. We are all people of God, regardless of our color, the language, the tradition, and everything. That's why God brought Jesus. Make those connections clear for us. And that's why Jesus was always moving to the margins of society, to those who have been excluded, so that he can bring them in. And it was because of that he ended up on the cross. Folks, a church who loses its memory about its foundation, about its beginning, about where it comes from, has no future at all. As I go around and up and down this country, this island of Adam, I can see signs of it, of it in every place. Church is being depleted. And there anybody going to church? We have great, wonderful buildings. Nobody to inhabit them, they can rush out somewhere. Have we forgotten where we've come from? Is the question I've been asking myself. And if we have, do we have the opportunity to go back? Start again. Start with the basics. We have become too sophisticated folks as Christians. Even now we talk about Jesus. I go to meetings and I listen to people talk about Christianity and Jesus. And I'm sitting down there and saying, I don't even understand what they're talking about anymore. It's all overlaid with so much theology and so much structure and so much legal line and so much this and that. And I'm saying, folks, let's go back to the gospel, to the beginning. Let's find our way. Relationship is at the heart of what a life of discipleship looks like. Relationship with God, relationship with others, and relationship with the environment. All of them relationships that enhance life rather than death. I am finishing now. <laughs> Every time I say that in my church, one of the just goes, ah. <laughs> So I'm telling you the four and the final story our destination. I'm very, very quick. In Revelation 7, the Apostle John gives us a vision of where a life of relationship, life enhancing relationship, is ultimately going to lead to the people of God. In other words, our destination. Here is what we read there. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Listen to this. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, worshiping God. Folks, it's a vision to me of being in relationship, life and life. Of God's desire and destiny for his people. His people recreated, his people redeemed, his people renewed, and regathered into one single people under one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Under redeemed, recreated, and renewed us to God's honor.
so, so easy to sing. And we're just going to repeat two lines which have struck me as we're singing them. Ready for all thy perfect will, by acts of faith and love repeat. And just to echo Zara's words, that Christianity and, and being a follower of Jesus, Jesus gave love in action. He just did not speak words of love, he acted <coughs> words of love. So I am praying that each of us here will be doers of the word, not hearers only. As we now bring our prayers to our Heavenly Father, confident he hears the prayers of his beloved children. God of one vineyard, you call us to abide in your love in all we do and say. We thank you for the witness of our brothers and sisters in other denominations here in our club. We lift before you Reverend Michael, Canon Arthur, and Fathers Paul Rick and David and Pastor Solomon. <coughs> And we pray, and I particularly pray, that may your loving spirit abide in us at our many local ecumenical gatherings. Grant that together we might always celebrate you with joy. Lord, we give you thanks for their work and witness, and we pray your blessing upon them. Pray for the Methodist Church in Ireland and thank you for the leadership of our President, Reverend Larry Abbasu, our District Superintendent, Reverend Andrew Doherty, our own Minister, Reverend Catherine, and our lay leaders, Gillian Hines and Ruth Matthews. And as you prepare to take up leadership of the Methodist Church in a few weeks, we prayerfully lift to you our Superintendent and President Designate. The Reverend David Mason. That through our prayer for support, David may feel your spirit, lead, and your peace in his heart. And in the room not to conference in June, as they prepare for ordination, we prayerfully remember the ordinance, Reverend Michael Jones and Reverend Daphne Hammond and their families. As Michael and Daphne prepare for ordination, May they know your peace in their hearts and your being in their lives. On this very special day, Lord our God, we thank you for the loving fellowship of our church family at Arthur and for the witness of all who worshipped here through the years. May our hearts and our witness remain a dwelling place for your life-giving presence in our community. By your grace, may we live out your mission, our mission statement, making Jesus our mirror and reflecting his love, that through our loving witness, others may meet Jesus. Touched by your goodness, grant us to be a reflection of that love in our homes and workplaces. May we pave the way for bridging rivalries and overcoming tensions. We make these and all our prayers in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sandra and Elijah. Our love of God and our commitment to his commandments is stronger than ever. And today's church celebrations, the completion of nearly the first few steps in a long journey that we will take together. And acknowledging that we can't do this without our Father's loving grace and help, we start to sing our concluding hymn, one I particularly love, written as a children's hymn, One More Step Along the World I Go. <clears throat>
observant, or hopefully none of you are that observant, you would have noticed that Sidney Carter wrote his book, I wrote his hymn when he was five. <laughs> <laughs> because I wrote Sidney Carter 1915 to 20. I meant 2020, because <laughs> I'm right old age of 95. <laughs> so uh, just before our final grace of blessings, I just have a few closing remarks I'd like to make. And those of you who know me best know that I spend many days and nights agonizing and planning and I, I'm a really, Sarah told me this morning, I'm a really good mentalist because I'm always very well prepared. Well, not enough, obviously, by this, but anyway. So I spent the last few nights and days, over the past few weeks and months, agonizing and praying over what I should say at the closing of our service this afternoon. In fact, the first thought that came to my mind that actually took my breath away was thinking how blessed and how fortunate I am to have been called to serve this wonderful church family here at Arklo and also the church family at Gorey. And I know that the ministers present who, who served here in Arklo in, in preceding years will agree with my sentiments. But today, by a few words, and there will be few, they focus especially on the Art Club church family. Because, you know, this afternoon's joyful service, it just didn't happen. It took months of hard work, prayer, and deep commitment, for which in return we received blessing upon blessing from God. And actually, that's why we're gathered here this evening, to thank God for all our blessings and to hopefully can, to be a blessing to others and in return be blessed ourselves. The Arthur Church family, the people at the body of Christ in this place on a Sunday morning, all of you took, took, used your special gifts to bring us to this morning. Many of you invested time, energy, and financial resources in this service preparation. And be assured that your sacrifices are deeply appreciated and received in love. Now, I'm not going to name any names because we all know that's a dangerous road to go down. <laughs> but you all know who you are. And more importantly, the God who created you, he knows who you are. He knows your heart. He knows the love you have for this church. He knows how you serve. So God blesses you, and I thank you. And now I want you to please look around at your brothers and sisters in Christ, because from our reading from Genesis 1, we are all made in God's image and likeness. You will never meet a person, even the most difficult people that we consider difficult, that God does not know. So we are all made in God's image and likeness. And from Zar's reflection, and also from Acts chapter 2, we learned that God dwells within each one of us. His spirit lives in each one of us. So now I urge you, just turn, smile, look at those around you, and lift each other up, using the words of the grace as we bless each other. <laughs> so the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit,
and the Methodist Church's World Development and Relief Partners, they have told us that they, they yes, they need clothes, yes, they need provisions, but above all, they need financial aid. And this, these people are working on the ground in Ukraine and in Poland and in surrounding countries, providing food, medicine, and other provisions to the people who have stayed in Ukraine. So with that in mind, I invite you um, to, to give something to, if, if you wish, to give something to our retiring collection, which we have baskets at the door. And, and all uh, anything donations will be passed on to the Methodist Church World Development and Relief Fund. And also to please remind you, and I'm sure you all are dying to have something to eat, I know I am. <laughs> Uh, to please come along to the Arco Bay Hotel where refreshments and also come on a, a meeting together and uh, it's not a formal event, it's a gathering so we can all pop around the table today but chat to each other and, and make, re, re, um, reacquaint ourselves with old friends but above all make new friends. So thank you everyone for being here today. And above all, who do we thank? Thank you. Our Heavenly Father.